This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the series Murder in Paradise, where I take you to some fabulous locales to talk about what else? Murder. One of my most favorite cities in the whole world is Florence, Italy. Italy in general is just gorgeous, but Florence holds a special place in my heart. It's the birthplace of the Renaissance, and I've long been fascinated by how many artists, poets, writers, and philosophers could originate at the same time and in the same place like they did in Florence beginning in the 14th century. Everything in Florence and in the surrounding Tuscan countryside is just a wonder to behold, from sculptures like Michelangelo's David to paintings like Botticelli's Birth of Venus to the architecture of Brunelleschi's Duomo, The list goes on and on. It's no wonder with beauty like this that the Italians are a passionate people. But between 1974 and 1985, seven of these passionate couples met a very tragic fate while meeting for trysts outside of Florence in the beautiful Tuscan countryside. There was a serial killer preying on young couples who would claim at least 14 victims. While news of this killer rocked Italy, Germany, and France and was even reported in the British media, It remained largely unknown in America. The story is fascinating, complex, and horrifying in nature. This is Chapter 2, The Monster of Florence. Today's episode is brought to you by MHC Choice. MHC Choice features European mysteries, dramas, crime shows, and comedies streamed right to your computer, TV, or favorite device. There are award-winning true crime series like The Godless, the acclaimed Dutch anthology series I've been telling you about that is based on true crime stories told from the perspectives of both the perpetrators and the victims. This week, I've also been enjoying the series In the Face of Crime. In this series, Merit Gorski, the son of Russian Jews, becomes a Berlin cop and works to uncover the city's criminal underworld. In the Face of Crime boasts a gritty reality that along with fascinating crime stories, also touches on the world of cultural and religious diversity and family bonds of Russian Jewish immigrants living in Germany. You'll get that, plus the entire MHC Choice Library, including TV adaptations of some of the world's best crime fiction writers in series like Agatha Christie's Criminal Games and Donna Leon's Brunetti Mysteries. There are over 2,500 hours of binge-worthy TV, with new content added each week, for only $7.99 a month. Try MHZ Choice for free for 30 days, and after that, you'll save 50% off your first month by going to mhzchoice.com slash once and using the offer code once at checkout. That's mhzchoice.com slash once and use the offer code once at checkout. And thank you for supporting the show. June 6, 1981, an engaged couple Giovanni Foggi, age 30, and Carmela Denuccio, age 21, had gone on a date to a disco in town. Afterwards, they took a drive up a hill in the Tuscan countryside near the town of Scandici. Young lovers often took to the hills and secluded roads outside of town to carry out their amorous activities. Many Florentines were raised in religious Roman Catholic homes where premarital sex was considered a sin. This, combined with the fact that it was customary for most young adults to remain living with their parents until marriage, made their automobiles the only option for romance, away from prying eyes and wagging tongues. In fact, the practice was so common that it was well known that voyeurs prowled the countryside peeping into car windows to spy on people making love in parked cars. There was even a name for them. They were called Indiani, or Indians. This was a colorful, if somewhat racist, description of the peeping toms who crept around in the dark, sometimes equipped with electronic equipment like night vision cameras and audio recording devices. But this night, it wasn't a voyeur who came upon Giovanni and Carmela, but something much worse. The couple became victims of a murderer. Giovanni would be found shot to death, still sitting in the driver's seat, his head leaning out of the window as if asleep. His fiancée also had been shot, but then her body had been dragged from the car and was found a few feet away in a field lying on her back. Framed by wildflowers and cypress trees, her body was a jarring sight. Such savagery amidst such a tranquil setting. She was naked except for a gold chain that had fallen, 
or been placed between her lips. Her pubic area had been cut away, leaving just a gaping hole. It would later be determined that although the placement and mutilation of the body pointed to sexual violence, the woman had not been sexually assaulted. It was also determined that a notched knife, like a scuba knife, had been used in the mutilation. The cuts on the body seemed so precise that authorities speculated that the killer might be a surgeon or a butcher. Soon after the murder, a known voyeur, Enzo Spalletti, was reported having spoken about the murdered couple before the bodies were even found. He was rounded up and arrested for murder. Four months later, on October 23rd, another young couple who were planning to be married a few months later were also found shot and stabbed. Stefano Baldi, age 26, and Susanna Camby, age 24, were found in a park 20 kilometers north of Florence. The woman was dragged from the car and mutilated in the same way as the previous victim. It was obvious to authorities now that they had arrested the wrong man. Spalletti was released. At the crime scene, similar bullet casings to the previous murder were found. They were tested and were determined to have been fired by the same weapon used in the June murders. Now investigators were convinced that a serial murder was on the loose. This was no jealous or spurned lover who was taking revenge. These were ritualistic-type killings of no apparent motive. While serial killers were, if not common, at least familiar to Americans, the French, and Germans, they were almost unheard of in Italy. Citizens began to panic, and people began suspecting neighbors and even their own family members. Investigators now remembered a case that had occurred seven years earlier in 1974. A teenage couple were found shot and stabbed to death on a country lane while having sex in the boy's car. Pasquale Genelcor, 19, and Stefania Patini, 18, were parked in a place that was known to be stalked by one or more voyeurs who'd been discovered behaving oddly. Stefania's body had also been violated with the grapevine stalk. She had been stabbed 97 times. The shell casings recovered from that crime scene were still in evidence. They were analyzed, and it was determined that they had been fired from the same gun, a 22 caliber Beretta with the same type of bullet, Winchester Series H copper jacketed rounds. The gun in all three murders had a defective firing pin that left an unmistakable mark on the rim of each shell. Eight months later, on June 19, 1982, childhood sweethearts Paolo Minardi, 22, and Antonella Migliorini, 20, a couple described as inseparable and who'd recently become engaged, were found shot on a country road, this time southwest of the city. It seems they must have been surprised by their assailant while parked close to the village. It was theorized that they saw their attacker approaching, and Paolo had tried to put the car into reverse to get away. The back wheels of the car, unfortunately, got stuck in a gutter and would not move. The killer shot out the headlights of the car and fled, without realizing he had left the man alive. Perhaps afraid nearby villagers would be alerted, he fled without committing the usual mutilation on the female, and leaving a potential witness as well. Unfortunately, Maynardi did not survive more than a few hours before succumbing to his injuries. The police decided to try and trick the murderer by asking journalist Mario Spezzi, who had been covering the case from the beginning, to write in his next column that the victim was able to give some information about his attacker before he died. They hoped this would unnerve the killer and cause him to make a mistake that might lead to his capture. The killer, who was suspected of killing eight people now, became known as the Monster of Florence. Twelve days after the last couple was found, an anonymous letter arrived at police headquarters in Florence. Inside was an old newspaper clipping about a homicide that had taken place in 1968. It was the double murder of a man and a woman who'd been having sex in a parked car. The clipping was accompanied by a note that simply said, Take another look at this crime. Police at first were confused. The 1968 murders of Barbara Locci, 32, and Antonio Lobianco, 29, had been solved. Locci was married, but was known around town as a woman who had several lovers. On August 21, 1968, Locci and her lover, Lobianco, were found shot to death in a car outside of town. At 2 a.m., her six-year-old son knocked on the door of a nearby home, telling the owner that, you have to drive me home because my mommy and my uncle are dead in their car. He had been asleep in the back seat when his mother and Lobianco were killed. Lochi's husband, Stefano Mele, a Sardinian, was picked up the next morning and it was determined with a paraffin test that he had recently fired a gun. 
He then confessed to killing his wife and her lover. He was convicted of their murders and imprisoned. But authorities said Mele could not be the monster who had committed the recent murders. He had still been in prison in 1981 when they began, and had only just recently been released to a halfway house in Verona. Mele was interviewed, and because of the statements he made asserting that, quote, they will continue to kill, it was speculated that Mele had not acted alone in the 1968 murders. The bullets from the decades-old murder were tested and matched the 1981 and 1982 murders. Now authorities believe Lochi's murder was a clan killing, in which other members of Mele's Sardinian circle were involved. If so, they could have had access to the original weapon. Perhaps, they theorized, one of them had enjoyed the act of killing so much, he had gone on to become the monster of Florence. Now the investigation became known as Pista Sarda, or the Sardinian Connection. They set their sights on three Sardinian brothers, Francesco, Salvatore, and Giovanni Vinci. All three had previously been lovers of Barbara Locci. They decided to arrest Francesco first. But in September 1983, while Francesco Vinci was still in jail, another double homicide occurred in an olive grove outside of Florence. The killer had come upon a young German couple who parked their Volkswagen camper for the evening while on a trip through Italy. However, it appeared that the monster had made a mistake. The couple were two young men, Wilhelm Meyer and Jens Rusch, both 24. Rusch was small in build and had long blonde hair and could have been mistaken for a female from afar. Neither was mutilated, but having discovered his mistake, it seems the monster instead tore up a pornographic magazine depicting gay men he found in their campsite, scattering the pieces on the ground outside of the camper. Instead of releasing Francesco, the police believed one of his brothers or other relatives must have committed this murder to throw authorities off the track. Once again, the same gun was used. They now suspected a second brother, Antonio Vinci, and arrested him on a guns charge. They interrogated him for hours, but he had nothing to say. They were finally forced to release him. Francesco remained in jail. Four months later, police charged two other Sardinians in the monster killings and released Francesco. The following summer, the monster struck again. On July 29, 1984, Claudio Stefanacci, 21, and Pia Rontini, 18, were shot and stabbed in Stefanacci's car. The killer then removed Rontini's pubic area as well as her left breast, and carried them off. Now the monster had murdered six couples, and the police had arrested and then released a constant stream of suspects. To the public, the polizia looked like incompetent boobs who didn't have the first idea of what they were doing. The government even offered a reward equivalent to almost 300,000 U.S. dollars for information leading to the capture of the monster, the highest reward amount ever recorded in Italian history. The public and tourists to the area were now warned in radio and television ads and through mass mailing campaigns not to go into the hills at night. Over a year later, the monster would be suspected of his most gruesome crime yet. Two French tourists, Jean Cravichvili, 25, and Nadine Moreau, 36, were surprised in their small tent while camping near San Casciano. The killer cut open the tent flap, and the couple, perhaps hearing the sound, moved to the front of the tent. The monster fired on them, and Nadine was shot to death inside. Jean, only hit in the wrist, was able to flee and ran into a nearby wood where he was chased down. His throat had been cut, and he was nearly decapitated. The monster then returned to Nadine's body and performed his ritual mutilation. Again, he removed and carried away her left breast. Now the monster would add a new indignity. The following Tuesday, one of the prosecutors in the case received an envelope in the mail. Cut-up letters from magazines were used to address the envelope. There were no fingerprints and the sender had taken care to use no saliva to seal the envelope. Inside, there was a piece of his last victim's breast. Police believed the killer was playing a sick game with them. He'd picked the tourists, they believed, because he thought they wouldn't be reported missing right away. He sent the letter to alert them that there was another victim they needed to find. However, if this was his goal... His plan was thwarted when a person picking mushrooms in the countryside came upon the bodies on Monday afternoon. The letter did not arrive until Tuesday. The prosecutors, still going on the Sardinian clan theory, 
refused to release the two they already held in custody, even though they could not have committed the murder of the French tourists. Even if they weren't guilty of this murder, the prosecutor was convinced that they knew who was. They now focused on Salvatore Vinci. Salvatore had been suspected of the death of his 19-year-old wife in 1961. She had died from asphyxiation by gas in their home. Her death was ruled a suicide, but many suspected that her husband had murdered her. Because the prosecutor didn't have any evidence to arrest Salvatore for the monster murders, he instead charged him with the murder of his wife. The prosecutor believed if charged with this crime, he might be able to get him to identify the monster. Salvatore Vinci's trial was a fiasco. Witnesses could not remember with any detail the long-ago death of Salvatore's bride, and the evidence was scant. He was acquitted, and as soon as he was released, he fled the area for parts unknown. The investigation into the Sardinian connection was now closed, and all the suspects were officially absolved. Investigators were back to square one, now with 14 unsolved murders. The public was outraged that the monster had not yet been caught. The case was now turned over to the commissario, or chief inspector, Ruggiero Perugini. He would later be fictionalized as Chief Inspector Rinaldo Pazzi in Thomas Harris's novel Hannibal. Harris would be inspired by the monster case and had even been a guest in Perugini's home while writing his novel about the fictional serial killer Hannibal Lecter. Perugini started with the assumption that even though the original weapon had been used in the Barbalocci murder, it had passed out of the hands of the Sardinians. His belief was that the monster wasn't connected to the 1968 murder. Then, using a computer program, he had tens of thousands of suspects entered into a database that could be cross-referenced. Various criteria such as convictions for sex offenses, propensity for violence, and past prison sentences were entered, and one name kept coming up again and again as they narrowed the results. That of a 69-year-old Tuscan farmer named Pietro Pacciani. Pacciani was a violent alcoholic who had been convicted of sexually assaulting his own daughters. His prison sentence also coincided with the lapse in murders between 1974 and 1981. One specific incident in his record especially caught Perugini's attention. In 1951, Pacciani had beaten a man to death whom he'd caught with his fiancée. He then raped her next to the dead man's body. During his interrogation, Pacciani had been recorded telling police that he'd gone crazy when he'd seen his fiancée bare her left breast to the man. In Perugini's mind, the amputation of the monster's victim's left breasts linked Pacciani to the unsolved murders. Perugini began a 12-day search of Pacciani's property. Uh, what? Is this Tuscany or Manitowoc County? While they took apart his house and garden inch by inch, nothing was found. That is, until the 12th day, when Perugini announced that an unfired 22 caliber bullet was found in the garden. Experts would later say that it might have once been in the murder weapon they were looking for, but tests were inconclusive. A piece of rag was also taken as evidence from the garage. A while later, the Carabinieri, the police branch of Italy's military, received a piece of a weapon determined to be a 22 Beretta. It was wrapped in a torn rag with an anonymous note, saying it had been found under a tree where Pacciani often went. The rag was matched to the piece of cloth, from Pacciani's garage, and it matched. On this evidence, Pacciani was arrested on January 16, 1993, and charged with being the monster of Florence. The public breathed a sigh of relief. But there were problems. The monster's attacks had been meticulous in their detail and stealthily carried out. Could a drunken brute prone to fits of rage have planned, carried out, and gotten away with these terrible crimes? It seemed hard to believe. Even more difficult to believe was that a 69-year-old man in poor health would have been able to run down a 25-year-old man through the woods and catch him and decapitate him. The French tourist was an athlete, an amateur sprinter. It seems unlikely he would not have been able to outrun an out-of-shape almost 70-year-old man. The trial that began in April of 1994 was televised, and the drama in the courtroom far exceeded the merits of the state's case. Pacciani sobbed and cried out in anguish during the proceedings, sometimes saying, I am a sweet little lamb, and I am here like Christ on the cross. Other times he cursed and swore in rage. 
Thomas Harris attended the trial and took copious notes, no doubt to incorporate some of the most colorful details into one of his crime novels, truth being stranger than fiction. The prosecutor never produced a murder weapon, eyewitnesses, or forensic evidence from the crime scenes that tied Pacciani to the killings. Even his wife and daughters, who hated him, told the court that he could not be the monster. He was drunk most of the time, they testified, and was home making their lives miserable, not roaming the countryside murdering strangers. Even so, Pacciani was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. When his mandatory appeal began, the prosecutor did the unthinkable. He refused to prosecute, stating a lack of evidence and calling into question the investigative work of the police. Was this a police investigation or a comedy of errors, he would scoff. On February 13, 1996, Pacciani was acquitted. The case was scheduled to be retried, but Pacciani died in 1998 before that trial could begin. But there would soon be another twist in the case, and while it might seem incredible, it made perfect sense to some Florentines. This episode is also brought to you by The Great Courses Plus. I, like many of you, love to learn new things. That's why I love The Great Courses Plus. By watching these courses, I'm always learning something new and fascinating. They're presented by award-winning experts in many different fields, including literature, science, history, and psychology. The Great Courses Plus makes it easy to watch and learn. You can stream lectures from any device or download the videos and watch them offline. And as a listener of this podcast, you can start watching for free. One course you might love is The Great Ideas of Psychology. I've been watching this course, and it's so engaging. I started with Violence and the Brain, and now I'm watching Minds Possessed, Witchery, and the Search for Explanations, where I'm getting some insight into how abnormal conduct has in the past been believed to be demon possession, like most famously in the Salem Witch Trials. And can I just say... I love this course's professor, Daniel Robinson. He reminds me of that favorite high school or college professor some of us were lucky enough to have who just turned learning into storytelling. He's awesome. So sign up for The Great Courses Plus by using my special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash crime to watch this course and any others for free for 30 days. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash crime. And thanks for supporting this podcast. The day Pacciani was acquitted, the police announced that they had a confession to the murders. Their witness, implicating a second man as well, confessed to being Pacciani's accomplice. The three men, he said, had been hired by a wealthy Florentine doctor to collect female body parts for black masses that were used as offerings to the devil. He and the second man were then convicted of murder even though the man who confessed didn't seem completely coherent and often contradicted himself. The first man was sentenced to life in prison, and the other to 26 years. The Florentine doctor was never identified, nor were any of the members of the satanic cult or any of the masterminds behind the attacks. The man who confessed said he didn't know the name of the doctor, that only Pacciani did. Pacciani, however, denied these allegations until his death. And the evidence against Pacciani presented at his first trial? The rag and gun were determined to have been planted, but just by whom was never revealed. The ballistics expert said he had been pressured by the prosecution to say that the bullet was found might have come from the murder weapon. A police officer was videotaped saying that he believed the chief inspector had planted the bullet in Pacciani's garden. Mario Spezzi, the journalist who published this allegation, was sued for libel. He later won the case against him. Soon after, he retired from journalism to pursue his dream of writing mystery novels. In 2008, a book about the case he co-wrote with the novelist Douglas Preston called The Monster of Florence became a bestseller. Spetsy became convinced that it was a nephew of the original suspects, the Vinci brothers, who was the Monster of Florence. This man, who was still alive and living in Florence, would have had access to the gun, and he fit the profile that had been created with the help of the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit. He was a tall, right-handed man in excellent physical condition who was an expert shot and skilled with a knife. This man, who is not identified since the case is still open and the evidence against him is only circumstantial, had begun a criminal career with the charge of breaking and entering and theft in 1974. He was tall and muscular and extremely self-assured, 
composed and cocky, according to Spetsy, who interviewed him at his home in 2001. In that interview, he admitted to carrying a scuba knife and pulling it on his own father during a fight. He also admitted to being away from the Florence area from 1975 to 1980, the same period of time when the monster killings had stopped. At the end of his interview, Spetsy asked him point blank, And so, you're not the monster of Florence? The man so charmingly answered, No, I like my pussy hole. The man walked the journalist to the door, and just before he opened it, he leaned forward in a low, gruff voice said in Spetsy's ear, Listen carefully. I never joke around. Even though there was little evidence that Pacciani or his so-called accomplices were responsible for the Monster of Florence murders, the police continued to assert that the killings were at the behest of a satanic cult of which Pacciani and his accomplices were instrumental. The public as well was willing and very ready to call the case closed. There had not been another murder attributed to the serial killer since 1985. The case had lasted over 40 years and more than 100,000 people had been investigated. Many innocent people's lives had been ruined when they or a family member were suspected of being the murderer. Some had been run out of town, and others had their families destroyed and their businesses ruined. Italians had never been subjected to this kind of case in their country, and frankly, they couldn't wrap their heads around it. The belief that one person could be responsible for such a random and vicious act against other humans was completely beyond their comprehension. When a theory was presented that Satan was behind the murders, many were quick to accept this explanation. In America and a few other countries where serial killers have been sought, captured, and studied for decades, we know that a lone psychopath can be responsible for tens, dozens, or even hundreds of deaths. Names like Bundy, Dahmer, and Gacy are commonplace to us. But to others, it's like trying to convince them that the boogeyman is real. In a place as steeped in the belief of heaven and hell, like Florence, Italy, to believe that satanic cults are collecting body parts to use in black masses might be more easily accepted. At least, some may reason, there is a motive attached to such an evil deed. To have to admit that these types of crimes are random and virtually without motive is terrifying in the extreme. Good versus evil is a prevalent theme in the psyche of Italians. This is the birthplace of Dante's Inferno, Michelangelo's Pieta, and St. Peter's Basilica, God's temple on earth. A photo of the Pope can be found in almost every Roman Catholic household, a constant reminder of how citizens are called to live, at least in theory, as a holy being with a heavenly purpose. Yes, these are generalizations to be sure, but it has to at least be acknowledged that these are ideas that the history and philosophy of Italy were founded upon. To understand these horrible events, even in part, as the work of the devil, has to be, well, comforting in some respects. If we can blame it on Satan, we can view our fellow humans and ourselves as inherently good and decent in nature. Maybe then, we can still believe that ultimately, good can win out over evil. Believing that, maybe we can all sleep a little better at night. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Thanks again to our sponsors, MHZ Choice and The Great Courses Plus. You can find links and offer codes in the show notes. And thanks most of all to you, the listeners. Thanks for all the ratings and reviews on iTunes and to all the new Patreon supporters. Don't forget, you can connect with me on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook. Join the Once Upon a Crime listener page too. You'll get to see photos from each episode, discuss the cases with me and other listeners, and get all the inside info. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Until next time, be good to one another.